we can deal with our problems, I think, in a much better way, even though were we prepared in any country, I don't think we were. This was such a fast and new phenomenon to everybody. It really took the world by storm. But I think in places like that, where you have huge pockets of people living so confined, it is a different problem and a much harder one. And to them, they're not getting food. We were giving them sanitation uh, kits going out first, and they said, well, we can't eat soap. We want soup. We are far more afraid of dying of hunger than we are of the COVID disease. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Greg Liar podcast. Today, we have our new partner from the all the way from the slums of Kolkata, India. We have Maureen Forrest here, who is the CEO of Hope Foundation. So Maureen, thank you for joining us. I would love for you to introduce yourself. Yes, um, my name is Maureen Forrest and I'm the founder director of the Hope Foundation. Uh, we were set up in, uh, we're, well, we're 21 years in existence this year. Um, I spend a lot of my time in Calcutta, but at the moment I am actually at home in Ireland as we're in lockdown and we all, I was supposed to be in Calcutta, but obviously it's not safe at the moment. So I'm back home in County Cork in Ireland, working as hard here as I possibly can because we desperately still need all the fundraising and funds uh, for our projects with the street and slum children in Calcutta. And more so even now, uh, because of what is happening there due to the coronavirus, which is, it's much different in situations where you have such vast numbers of people all gathered together cheek by jowl in small tiny rooms, just plastic rooms, almost not much bigger than any of our bathrooms. And for them, uh, so social isolation obviously would be a luxury because it can't happen. And yet they're in lockdown, which means that they're now being kept in these very small spaces. And I think the great tragedy of all of this actually is because these are daily laborers, they do not have any income, they only get paid for the day that they work. And that is just a meager amount. And now, unfortunately, that's not happening. And they have no money. So they can't buy any food. And as in the situation with most of these workers, they're not registered by the government. They don't have any other cards. They don't have ration cards. So these are really the forgotten people that will not get anything to eat. They won't get any, be part of any food distribution or any of the uh, groups that are getting the 500 rupees from the government. These people have nothing, no shield, no anything, no safety net to protect them. So really, we're only probably I suppose, touching the tip of the iceberg, but that's a very important place to start. So we are feeding as many people as we possibly can. Already, we've reached out to, I think it's over 60,000 people, just with a small, small team of people, mostly attached to our little hospital under um, the care of Samarin. And the food is being distributed with Samarin by volunteers that are really the most amazing group of young boys these were little were boys were little when we first got them in hope they were rescued from the stations they were blue sniffing they were because they had nothing they had no homes they had no anything so these are the boys that we took into Punarjeevan home it was a drugs rehabilitation home these boys are now rehabilitated and these are the people the boys, they're older than boys now, but I will always call them boys because I know them since they were boys. These now are the boys that are helping, giving back to their people uh, by going out without proper protective uh, gear, I might add, and, and really risking their lives to make sure that they don't want people to suffer like they suffered as little children. Well, Maureen, I am extremely excited that Donor C is now partnering with the Hope Foundation. I think that the work that you've been doing for many years now is incredible. And um, I, I recently found out that Jeremy Irons, who played 
Scar in The Lion King. That's how you know people in America might might be most familiar with him. He actually visited the Hope Foundation in Calcutta, and we have a, a brief clip from his trip out there. So I'm going to play that for our viewers now, so that they can get an idea of what it's like on the ground there. Hello, I'm Jeremy Irons, and I'm talking to you from Calcutta, India. I've been here looking at the work of the Hope Foundation, and I'm amazed by what I've seen. I've been here for seven days and seen the most extraordinary children's homes, the most extraordinary work, their hospital, the hope that they are giving to so many children in Calcutta who had no hope before hope arrived. It's Christmas. If you feel you can spare a few pence, a few pounds, whatever, then please send it to Hope, the Hope Foundation in Cork, and I can tell you that your money will make an incredible difference. Thank you. All right, Maureen, well, again, thank you for being here. We're excited about your work. Uh, my first question for you is, what are some of the unique challenges in the world of COVID-19 facing India specifically? You, you briefly touched on it at the introduction, but I'd love to know what, what you're most concerned about with that. Yes, I think really, I suppose, what, what most people would be concerned about would be the absolute population of India. There's a population of 1.4 billion people and where the majority of these people, and even the figure of, I, I'm, it's the figure that we're getting, 80% of daily laborers, 80% of the workforce are daily laborers. And these are the people that are actually, when they were in Delhi, they, when lockdown came, they tried to make their way home. They've had to walk, some of them cases, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers to get back to their villages where they thought they would get some rescue. But uh, they had no transport to get them back. So these people, some of them may have it leaving Delhi. And of course, then it's going to get spread from place to place as they travel back. There aren't enough uh, ventilators in the hospital. I think I heard a figure of about 17,000 for that population. Probably more now, but in the beginning, that's all they had. And I think um, it's... Um, one bed for every thousand people so so th there's nothing there it, it 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 just to me if it really gets into the slums and in the little alleys and the busty areas where we do most of our work it will be like uh, a pandemic tsunami really you know because there isn't any way it, it, it's at the moment what they're trying to do is they have hot spots identified hot spots where they know there is covid and I mean, their way of dealing with that at the moment, and it's probably the only logical thing they can do, is just spraying and spraying two or three times a day, trying to force the people to stay in these confined spaces. So it, it's nothing like we could ever imagine. I suppose I can see it and visualize it because I have been going there for the last 25 years and I see you know, the situation in the slums. I see the migratory people that have come in I've seen the way they have to scavenge on the dumps to make a, a living. And even that's gone because there's, you know, they're not being paid for the, the pittance that they were getting for doing that. So the problems are so, you know, we can deal with our problems, I think, in a much better way, even though where we prepared in any country, I don't think we were. This was such a, a fast and new phenomenon to everybody. It really took the world by storm. But I think in places like that, where you have huge pockets of people living so confined, it is a different problem and a much harder one. And to them, they're not getting food. We were giving them sanitation uh, kits going out first, and they said, well, we can't eat soap. We want soup. We are far more afraid of dying of hunger than we are of the COVID disease. So that's trying to give a picture of how difficult it is where these little people we work with are. You know, that's, that's a really vivid picture. And as you were talking about the number of ventilators, it's mind boggling. 17,000 ventilators for a population of 1.4 billion people. We have probably that many ventilators in one city in the US here. And, and I would imagine somewhat similar in Ireland, but yes. there in the entire country of over a billion people, they're, they're sharing just such limited resources. Yeah. And, you know, in, in 
like in many other places in the world, you've got the 20% of the population who is not living on daily wages who might be able to get access to some of that stuff. But then there's 80% of the population who the workforce. are, yeah, they're vulnerable. I don't know how else yeah. to put it. They're in, in a tough position. And that is yeah. who you are serving with your Hope Hospital. So I would love for you to talk more about, you know, what, we, what I want to do for you is I want people to get extremely ecstatic about supporting Hope Hospital. That's what they should feel like. This it. is a huge opportunity to support your amazing work on the ground in the slums mm -hmm. of Kolkata. I've already had people who have been donating to you and they're so proud to be able to support your work. So would you mind telling and us we about- We really appreciate that. Yes. Appreciate everybody so much that, that, I mean, our huge thing really always is the overwhelming majority of generosity of the people that support us. Yeah, and, and I think that there are a lot of generous people out there who want to help you. So I'd love to yes. hear more about what Hope Hospital is doing there on the ground in India. Yeah, well, Hope Hospital, uh, is, so normally Hope Hospital is, it was, it, it has a sort of a little history in so far as that I was traveling out one evening, we had ambulances going out at night and I found a little girl and she got very bad cuts in her head. And in Calcutta, because of the intense heat, if you don't treat a wound, and this sounds awful, but I, I was so upset when I saw it that first time, it develops into maggots infestation. Mm -hmm. And when I yeah. picked this little girl and she looked so, she was in such pain. Her head was swelling. And I went to about four different hospitals with her to try and get her into a hospital. But nobody would take her. She was a little street child and they didn't want her. So eventually we got her into a private hospital. And uh, private hospitals took her, they're quite expensive. We were able to afford to pay for this little girl and she got better. But I was thinking after that because we were meeting many patients. We couldn't afford for every patient we picked up off the street to be put into a private hospital. Our funds would be diminished in no time at all. So we decided that we'd actually build a small hospital that would just strictly take street people and slum people, people that were being refused into any other hospitals, including government hospitals. So I met a wonderful lady from Weight Watchers and she was at a lunch, I was talking at it, and I spoke about what I, our dream of trying to get this hospital. And she said, I will build it for you. Mm. And she started fundraising all over Ireland and the north of Ireland at that stage. And we had that hospital up and running in two and a half years. Wow. And it's been just the center, uh, a beacon of light for so many poor people that would never get that kind of care. We have top uh, doctors top class doctors and we cover a lot of all the different diagnostics and uh, uh we have all different consultants and surgeons and it, it's still a tiny hospital but it's a little hospital with a soul and it's everybody loves it and the care that we give to the people there is all it, it, will, it doesn't matter who they are they get exactly the same care as they would in a five-star hospital someplace else and it's wonderful and we extended it there not long ago which meant more room and when we can afford it, we'll add another little piece on. But it, it is, it, and Samarin is brilliant. He, he mm -hmm. runs the hospital. So that's the story of the little hospital. But we do so much there. There are so many operations. We've uh, saved so many people. We actually, uh, because when the patients can't go anywhere, we give cancer treatments. So, so it's, it's a little hospital with a huge heart. I love that. And as you were talking about that, I'm just thinking about how amazing it is that you had someone who came along and saw the vision and helped you build this whole thing in two and a half years. And I can't just, if, if I was thinking about being one of those people who was in, in the bottom 80%, daily living off of daily subsistence, and I don't have any medical options for myself. And uh, all of a sudden, this hospital comes out of nowhere and is now able to treat severe cases, able to provide surgeries for people. That's yes. an incredible thing. Even brain thing. surgery. And heart Even surgery. brain surgery. That's, uh, that's quite so. I had no idea. That's amazing. <laughs> So um, it's just Hope Hospital, that is the perfect name for what you're doing. Um, mm. Would you mind talking about some of the challenges that have come up as you've been, you know, these are complex situations. There's a lot of difficulties when you're working in these environments. What are some of the challenges that you've had to work through? Well, I, it's, um, I am with Hope for 21 years. But when I first went there, I was with another charity. And um, 
of course there are many challenges it's not it's 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 not easy when you're in another country and you don't understand the culture the religion the laws everything is very very different so you have to become very streetwise and very astute and ensure that you get a team around you that know what they're doing a team that you can trust which i did i met i met a most amazing uh, young indian lady she was very young at that time Geeta Vandakrishnan. And from Gita, we built this amazing team. We have over 300 uh, people working now in India, in wow. our team part of it, in, in our homes. We have uh, 10 homes where we have uh, neglected children that have been abandoned or children that have been very badly abused. We also have a drugs rehabilitation unit. We have a training little restaurant where we train um, young girls uh, in hospitality and in cooking we also have a tailoring unit and we have four different uh, computer skills computer and spoken english skills uh, centers so it, it's 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 quite a big operation one that i suppose in the beginning we thought we would open one home and have care for 20 children and have them in a beautiful place as close to our homes as we possibly could but this organization really had very much a mind of its own. And we met amazing people who just wanted to help and they kept giving. And then we had to get into strategic planning and getting totally all, you know, everything had to be, our governance is, is, is top rate, uh, our accountability, our transparency. So, so uh, we do a pretty good job for just a small little dedicated team of people that Try to make a difference. That's what we're trying to do and try to help people. Well, I'm thrilled to hear that you keep hitting all of the, the buzzwords I want to hear. So one of the things that we're, we're really passionate about at DonorSea is uh, putting the expertise in the hands of the locals. They understand the yes. culture, they understand the, the opportunities for impact. They also understand that there are people who are not so honest in their midst and they need to watch out for those as well. And they are able to do those things because they've lived there. And in your case, yes. for 21 years now, you've been involved in this community. You know all of it. You've, you've seen it from every way. my colleagues. I live there for four exactly. years. Exactly. And that's why I love being there for four Because they're my friends. They're, mm -hmm. We are close colleagues. We phone one another during this you know, time now. When it's a hard time for being there, I talk to Samarin every day. I talk to Geet every day. I talk to Mr. Das every day. I talk to just... You know, just that we're all reassuring one another. They find it difficult there. We, in our own way here, are finding it isolated as well because I'm totally cocooned. I can't get out at all. Uh, I mean, they have some cheek, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, so we all have, I suppose, our, our, it's a frightening time for everybody. Yeah. This is something that we never, in our wildest dreams, I mean, I'm much, much older than a lot of people. And um, I, I, I have volunteered. I had been in Somalia. A terrible famine was there. Actually, I was there. The Americans came in that time, and I short got out shortly after Black Hawk down. That that terrible time. Mm -hmm. I was in Rwanda after the genocide. So I've seen terrible things, and yet there's something about this that's it's pandemic. It's world. It's it's taken us really by totally unawares. You know. It's, yeah. Us, you know, even with the warnings, which was still so quickly and so devastating. And it's yeah, it's going to be quite something. We're we're watching it very closely. You know, at, at Donor see our main thing is we serve the poorest people in the world on the worst day of their lives. That's our, yes. our main focus. And you know, we're worried about some of the bad days that are ahead of us. Yes. And um, we're looking for partners who have expertise, who have been involved in their local community, who are passionate about what they're doing to. Um, work alongside them to help them fundraise and help support their work. And so, um, yeah, we're thrilled to be able to to do this with Hope Hospital and the Hope Foundation. We just think what you're doing is really, really good, really important. And it's a scary time. And there's that there's that Mr. Rogers quote where, you know, he, he talks about being a young boy and his, uh, his he's watching the TV and there's all these scary things on TV. And Mr. Uh, his, his mom says to him, well, whenever you see scary things, look for the helpers. Look for the people who are doing good amidst these scary situations, and, um, and you're you're one of those helpers. And so we're just thrilled to be able to to be alongside you and uh, alongside your your friends on the ground. 
Um, so yeah, thank you again so much. Uh, I would love for you to quickly touch on one of your, your board members actually brought it to my attention that something that you're passionate about is sustainability. And yes, I, yes. I would love for you to, to talk about some of the ways that you're working on that with uh, Hope Hospital. Well, um, at present, the Hope Hospital is almost totally uh, sustainable in so far as that it is generating its own income. Uh, we are, or I'd say they're almost up to, what, 85% of um, their income. In the, in the hospital, we support a lot of other NGOs and organizations, uh, including the Missionary Sisters of Charity, Mother Teresa's nuns, if you've heard of them. Oh, cool, yeah. They take quite a, a lot of their patients because they have no place. They don't have a hospital and they need a hospital, so they come to us. Wow. They, they have a budget to care for their people, so they obviously uh, help us you know it, it sort of goes round uh, to support their patients in the hospital so and then we also have an outpatients and that really it deals with the very poor they will never be refused but it also deals with there's a lower middle class that wouldn't have a lot of money and couldn't afford to go for private whereas our our center is is marvelous and they go and they can afford to pay something so this is where we can get the money. We get a little bit of the richer people who go there. Uh, it's a Robin Hood. So mm -hmm. that is one of our almost sus sustained yep. projects. Yeah, we have a school in Malawi that has a similar model where the people who can afford it pay kind of yes. a market rate and then the people who are more vulnerable um, get a reduced yeah. rate. And that's a good we way to do it. We never excuse yeah. anybody. Yeah, that's we wonderful. have a little pharmacy on that as well, but that obviously makes money as well. So we, we, we see... Uh, the openings where we can make money as well. Mm -hmm. So one day that hopefully it would be totally, totally secure. Yeah. And, you know, I tell people, I think, I think striving for sustainability is a good thing, it but is. also you're, you're serving the poorest people in the world. You know, I, I don't think there, uh, you should be expected to be totally sustainable because um, you're in some ways you're cleaning up society's messes. Like it's, you, you're going to need donations to keep running. It's a good thing for people to support the work that, that you're doing. Um, and the fact that you're striving, striving, striving for sustainability, that's a, that's, that's a bonus. That's cream on the top. You know, that's a really good thing. And as well as that, actually, we have set up quite a strong fundraising team in India itself. Plan Amazing. That, you know, India is getting, as we know, the world knows, is, is improving. It has a new uh, upper middle class. It has people earning more money. So a lot of our funds, oh, I'd say, oh, I can't think off the top of my head. Oh, not half, but coming up there of our funds, actually, yeah. are coming from in-country India. So, so I That's think, an unprecedented amount. That's pretty substantial to have half coming from that. Yeah. So that's yeah, really because great. there are, as I kept stressing to Gita when we you have wealth, they must help you. You know, it's they, you must get money from your own people as well. Yeah. Mine continuing until it gets to a stage when maybe one day they'll say, Guys, we, you know, you've done as much as you can for us. And, uh, you know, so, but I think that would be the beautiful answer if we weren't needed there, really. You know? Yeah, I think that, that's I'm also here. wonderful. Um, and we for the, at this particular time he needs a lot of our support yeah and i think he's the one who's kind of helping with uh the donor c partnership he is he's great yeah. um yeah he's doing an excellent job and it sounds like he's incredibly busy we're trying to not take too much of his time because we, we want to make sure he's able to be freed up to yes. do the actual work that's important yes um yeah if i this has been really wonderful and i'd love to at some point do this again but what if there's any kind of like last words you want to share with my audience or with people who are looking to support your work, what would you share with them? I think, I suppose for me, I am so blessed that I have a purpose in life and that my purpose is just to help other people. And I think if you have, without a purpose, I think you're, you have no sort of real function in life. Whereas if you have a purpose, you don't think of yourself that much. You think of what you can do for other people. And not everybody can help everybody. But I think that if we could all just give a little, that would really help the whole world. So just a little. We don't ask people to give questions. We love getting them and we always appreciate them. But whatever people can give, just, I suppose really I know the difference it makes to the people. 
I see it when I'm over there. I've seen the little kids from when I first started. They're now married. Some of them are, one of our kids is in university. We had one kid over in Pennsylvania. She got a scholarship from uh, the uh, Council General in, in Calcutta. And she studied in Pennsylvania with other kids doing accountancy, all doing. And if you see that, these are children that had no hope. And that is the miracle of life giving children a sustainable livelihood and a freedom, a freedom of choice. Most people don't have a choice. They, especially the people we were, they wake up in the morning, they don't even have food or probably clothes to wear. We wake up in the morning, we look out, well, we look down, we can choose any shoe. You know, we have a choice of everything. We can go down, have breakfast, have a choice of everything. They are denied that huge fundamental right, choice. So, we fight for choice and just, and I suppose really our whole thing, our vision would be to live in a world where it should never hurt to be a child. Maureen, thank you so, so much. Uh, I can just tell that you're bursting at the seams with passion and you just, you care so much about this cause and you've won me over. I'm sure you've won our audience over. So thank you so much. And I hope that you get all of the support that you need, especially during this incredibly, incredibly difficult, difficult. time. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. And I can't thank you enough. For, for, for taking part and being part of, of our it's our pleasure <laughs> yeah okay thank you so much Greg. thank you all right take care